Alrighty, everyone. So welcome back to another episode of Learn to Play Live. Um, so my other camera isn't working right now, so we're just going to make do with this. Um, so today, the game that I'm going to be teaching you guys how to play is a game called Broom Service. So it's a bit like um, hand management, bluffing, and it has a pick up and deliver style to it. Um, it's a super underrated game that I don't hear talked about much, but it's one that I show, um, that I, I play at our game group quite often and everybody absolutely loves it. So I'm hoping to, um, show you guys this and hopefully do it justice a little bit. Unfortunately, with the bluffing games, whenever you watch, um, these kinds of videos, it doesn't always really show the full impact that you get from playing the game because... Um, teaching the game rules itself isn't the, f the fun part of the game, or, well, yeah, it, the rules are very simple, and so the most fun in the game that you'll have is actually with playing with a group of people, because, um, throughout the game you can essentially block people from doing actions, um, so it's a pretty fun mechanic in the game. Now, um, in the game, when you play... Okay, sorry about that. A little bit of mic technical difficulties there. More like dog technical difficulties. Um, anyway, so um, Broom Service is played over seven different rounds. And you will get um, this stack of event cards that will also impact your gameplay. So you basically shuffle the ten that are given to you in the uh, deck. And then you select seven of them and flip the top one. So that will be your... your time tracker basically everyone starts on 10 victory points on the board because there are events here that allow you to sacrifice some of your victory points to um advance or do different effects um the other thing that you'll place on the board this is i, I set up for a basic um gameplay so on the board here you have also these storm clouds that have a sun symbol on them and a lightning bolt. So the sun symbol is actually how many magical wands you'll need to take care of them and I'll explain that in a minute. So you'd randomize those, shuffle them up, play them on the board. There are some special ones that have, here let me pull them out here, that have special symbols on them. So if you did want to set up for advanced play, you could always do that. Um, and they will have different items on them, like this. So you can set up for advanced play that way. The other thing that you can set up for for advanced play as well are these amulets. So uh, these will score you victory points at the end of the game. And these are placed down here. Um, in the different mountain regions on top of these castles. But for the basic setup, I'm not going to, um, to set those up. So the game does scale really well. It plays up to five players. So right now I have it set up for a five player game. You can, however, have less. And the way that that works is that each player will have their own deck of cards to play with that are colored. So you can see here there's green, red, yellow, black, and blue. So each of these decks of cards will have exactly the same cards in them. So everybody plays with the same deck of cards. It's just the color back that differentiates them. If you're playing with less players, you set aside one of these decks of cards. And then if you're playing with four, you would flip one card and players cannot play that card. If you're playing with three players you would flip two and if you're playing with two players you would flip three so that limits which cards that you can select for your actions in the game so i'm going to show you each one of these cards just because they're really adorable and if you don't pay attention to them um you can miss the sort of funny parts really quick so this is a um gatherer card as an example here and he is a fruit gatherer Let's see if we can focus. And his name is Barry. Let's 
see if we can get this here. Come on. There we go. Berry. And then we have a root gatherer whose name is Rudy, which I think is hilarious. And then you have some druids. So this druid, for instance, is named Chip Top, and he's a peak druid. The artwork on them are really fantastic, too. I mean, it's just a really beautiful game. Um, and then we have a weather fairy, and her name is Drizelda. And we have a forest witch. So you have druids, witches, and gatherers. This forest witch... is Will Defire. And then we have Brock Bottom. He's my favorite. So he's the Valley Druid, and his name is Brock Bottom. And then we have Lannislide, Tori Nado, Avalanche, and Herbie. So in the game, you have these 10 different action cards. So each round, you'll be selecting four of the 10 action cards to play. Provided that the event deck here doesn't tell you to do something different. So again, you're going to be playing seven rounds and selecting um, four of the cards. Now the way that the game works and the way that the cards work is that you have different witches based on their location on the board. So you have a mountain witch, a hill witch, a prairie witch, and a forest witch, which each represent the different areas on the board. So you can see here there's yellow, green, gray, and brown, which represents each of the different areas on the board. So the witches allow you movement. So we're starting out at these different castle points here. So if you wanted to move to a mountain area, you would play the mountain witch. If you wanted to move to a hill area, you would play the hill witch. So on and so forth. So if I'm in a prairie area like we are here and I wanted to move to the forest, I would select this forest witch as one of my actions to take that turn. And then provided that it went the way that I wanted to, and I'll explain that in a second here, I would move my, um, my pawn or my little, it's actually like a little witch with a hat. It's really cute. Um, the herd gatherers, which we have three of. We have root, herb, and fruit. So one of the three colors that also represent the three different colored potions that you can collect during the game. So if you're needing to collect green potions, you would select the herb gatherer and that would generate green potions for you. So on and so forth throughout the different colors. Now you'll notice on the board that there are also different towers matching those colors. So let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. Get a little bit closer. Okay, so the different areas or the different towers on the board also match those colors. So as you could assume, each of those different towers will only accept a certain color of potion. So you have to travel with your witch across the board and deliver these potions to different towers to get victory points. So for instance, this tower here is a purple tower with a five victory point um, amount there. So you would get your witch over here to the uh, brown area and then you would deliver your potion to that tower and that would net you five victory points. So the same would apply to any of the other areas on the board uh, based on their color. Now, it's a little bit hard to see here, so actually I'm going to take this camera off and, and go quite a bit closer. So, on the board, you can actually see here that there are square peaks and that there are also round, uh, or tower tops. So, something like this here is a round tower. So, that one there... Um, you can see the arrow is pointing in. The potion actually stays on the board and stays there. So that spot is blocked going forward. So another witch cannot deliver a potion to, um, to that tower. Now, the square peaks, you'll notice that they have arrows pointing out. So the arrows pointing out 
those um, towers, you actually drop the potion off and it goes away from the board just back to the supply. So the ones that have the arrows pointing out don't actually have anything blocked on them. Alrighty, let's get this set back up. Thank you, it's a Harry Potter tattoo. Alrighty, so back to the explanation. So, um, that's, that's basically what's on the board. Now, at the start of the game, you're going to flip this card event deck. So as I said, you have seven for the entire game, and that's how many rounds you have. So you're going to flip the first one and then read whatever it says. So players who, cow who play cowardly this round may choose to take three victory points instead of performing the action. So you'll notice on each of the cards, and this is really the fun of the game, on here, on the bottom of the card, there is a cowardly action, and on the top of the card, there is a brave action. So when you're going through and playing your different action cards, you're going to select whether you want to be a brave or a cowardly, in this case, herd gatherer. So you can see that being brave generates a better result. So you gain more potions and also a wand. However, if you are cowardly, you only gain one. Now you might be wondering, well, why would you go cowardly? Well, that's the fun of the game. If you go brave, every person who goes after you has the option of playing the same card. And if they go brave, you do not get to take that action. However, if you go cowardly, you get to take the action. So the sequence of play would go around as the first player would, would choose and say, I'm a herd gatherer. And then you would say whether or not you want to go brave or cowardly. If you go cowardly, you take the action immediately, gain your resource, and then it goes to the next person. And they will then play whether or not they are a herd gatherer. So if somebody does have that card, they have to play it in sequence but they can still choose to go cowardly if they want to and do the same thing that you did and take the uh, cowardly action, just gain the resource and keep going. But if that person does decide to go brave, if the next person after them also decides to go brave, that previous person loses their action, so they get to do nothing. So it's a bit of press your luck type thing in hand management, bluffing in a way paying attention to what other people have played because then you'll know whether or not they have that action going forward. So it's a really fun uh, fun game and it can be really surprising when you go around the board when you think that, oh, you know, you're looking around the board, oh, no one's going to go there and then they play it, you go brave and they take that action away from you. So it's really quite fun. So based on your position on the board, you would select four of your cards. Let's say that you really want to collect resources because we all start the game with only three different potions. So you might want to select, you know, a couple um, herb gatherers, let's say a witch to allow for movement. And then the other thing that you can select is a druid. So the druid is the delivery um, aspect of the game. So you can see here on the card that the druids deliver magic potions to towers based on whether they are, uh, you know, valley druid or a peak druid, you can deliver to certain areas. So in this case, it's green and yellow. So you could deliver to either a forest or a prairie region. Now, if you take the brave action again, you're going to get an additional three victory points. If you take the cowardly action, you would just deliver it and gain whatever victory points are on that tower. So, Again, it's a bit of a press your luck type of thing and bluffing because the only way to really win is to try and take additional actions from these brave actions. So it's obviously in your best interest to wait till you're the last player in the round to go brave. But if you do go brave, you're the next to play first in the round. So you might not want to go brave that round and wait another round to go brave so that you don't have to be forced into going first. So really you have to mitigate, you know, which ones do I really want to try and get that action from or which ones don't I? Um, and then the last thing is um, quite an important thing here on the board is actually this um, weather fairy here. So she's the one that uses the magical wands to get rid of storm clouds. So as you can see on the board, I have these storm clouds placed over 
They're on top of lakes and they are on top of some regions. Now you cannot travel into these regions until you've cleared these spaces. Um, and you can't fly over lakes either. So when you are in a region adjacent to a cloud, you can play this fairy and spend the appropriate amount of wands to then clear a cloud. Why is that important? Because each of these clouds have little lightning bolts on them, and that is for set collecting in the game. So the more lightning bolts that you've collected throughout the game, the better it is. Now, in the case of individual clouds, you can see here one of these has a three requirement, the other one has a one, which means that you must spend either three for this one, three wands, or the other one you spend one wand. So it's in your best interest to only spend one wand for the one lightning bolt. But if somebody else gets to it first, then they do. Now the other interesting thing about the game is that whoever decides which card to play, you have to follow. Which means if you really wanted to do a move action, so in that way it's a little bit programming. Um, so if, if they chose to do a move action and then a deliver, but you needed to do a deliver and then move, well, it can mess up your turn order. So going first is important. So that's the other reason why you might want to go brave um, to try and go first the next round to ensure that the cards that you're playing come out in the order that you want them to. Let's move this back up here a little bit. Okay. So I'll just go through um, one of the turns and um, how it plays out, and then we can go from there. So, as I said, on your turn, um, whoever's controlling the stack, it doesn't really matter. They're going to flip this card, read it out loud. It is in bilingual French and English, which is fantastic, and so are all the fairy cards. Um, read that out and then that'll impact it. In this case, anyone who goes cowardly this round can choose to just take three victory points instead of the reward. So you might want to do that in case somebody plays, you know, one of these, uh, the, f the action that messes up your turn and you can't actually resolve this action. Well, instead of resolving the action, you could just take three victory points. So on this turn, I would look at my hand, the entire stack of 10 cards and decide what I want to do. So in this case, I might take, you know, a fruit gatherer. I'm right next to a lightning bolt and there is a one um, there. So maybe I'll take her. And then I might want to move over to, let's say, a mountain region. And then let's pick a peak druid because I might want to deliver in this mountain region. So that's sort of how the turn goes. Then on each turn, if I'm the first one, I would say I am a peak druid. And then I would decide whether or not I want to be brave or cowardly. Again, if I decide that I'm cowardly, I immediately deliver a magic potion to the tower on a hill or mountain. If I choose brave, it goes to the next person. Now let's say that this blue player also picked a peak druid. So this is the blue player. I was the green player. They would say, I am also a peak druid. They would play their card, and then if they went brave, I, as the green player, would lose out on my peak druid action. So, <laughs> it's a little hard to simulate the excitement that that generates, but we've played games where, you know, you didn't think for the life of you that anybody would have this card, and you go brave, then the next person goes brave, then the next one goes brave, and then the last one goes brave. And it's just this, this sense of excitement that, you know, you've kind of taken this action away from everybody else. So at its core, it's a very simple game. It's really you're just moving to different areas, delivering potions, and or gathering resources here. But the, the big fun of the game is being able to sort of understand what your opponents have and make sure that you're playing them. Pretend, Jason, I'm not going to pretend like I'm excited. But um, I was a little bit, you know, worried about showing this game just because the, the gameplay is so simple. Um, but it really is such a fantastic game and it's so underrated and I don't, I don't know if it's because maybe the artwork or the simplicity in its play, but, um, it, it gets really fun when you're playing with, you know, a group of five people and you could have every one of those actions taken out. But, you know, last time we played, we were playing four players 
And of the four cards that each of the players selected, we had each selected three of the same cards. I've never seen that happen ever. So it was, it was quite a big shock, but I'll just show you here quickly how a turn would unfold. So let's say, uh, so I'm the green player here and I say, I'm a cowardly mountain witch. So I'd play that card. It would go, I would move my green pawn to a mountain region. So I do have two of them, two witches. So I could move her here or I could move her here. So let's say for argument's sake, I just move her here. Then it goes around the table. People decide to play uh, or they have to play a mountain witch if they are a mountain witch and then decide whether they are brave or cowardly. And then it'll continue. Then the last person to go brave will select an action. So let's say they selected Peak Druid and then it comes back around to me. So then I say, I am a cowardly peak druid because I really want to deliver that potion. And I am in a mountain region down here. So I would take the appropriate one. Now the only tower that's down here is this orange tower. So I have to deliver an orange potion from my pool to that tower. So in this case, I would place my orange potion there and I would collect four victory points. So one, two, three, four. Then... Let's say that, you know, I played this. So, and I say, I'm a brave fruit gatherer instead of cowardly. So if I had chosen cowardly, I would do the action immediately. But as you can see with the brave action, it goes to the next player and they have the option to go brave or cowardly. If they go brave, I get no action. So I'm taking a chance here because I really want three potions. So I'll go brave and then we go around, woof, I lucked out, nobody else went brave. So I'm gonna take my two purple potions and then a random potion. Well, I just spent an orange potion, so I'm gonna go ahead and take two purple and an orange potion and I put it in my pool. Then it comes back around again. Oh, somebody played the movement card earlier. So I wanted to get to this cloud here. Luckily, my second pawn is still adjacent to it. So I would play my weather fairy card and I could go brave and try and get that extra three victory points from it, but I might end up not getting it all. So in this case, I really want to make sure that I get this one cloud. The other one is a two and a three because I only have one wand. So in this case, it's not really worth it for me to risk it because if somebody else does a cowardly action before me, then that's going to mean that I cannot now get a cloud there. So I'm going to go ahead and do a cowardly weather fairy with Drizilda, spend my one wand, and I'm going to take this cloud. So that's basically all the game entails is just going around... Um, playing your four selected action cards and doing them in whatever order is played by the last brave person. So I would 100% recommend this game to anybody. It's fantastic for kids. I have this on my top 10 list of games to play for Halloween because it's a light game. It has a little bit of everything, you know, hand management, a little bit of bluffing, pick up and deliver. Um, and the theme is so cute and these cards, like I said, I mean, just take a minute and read through them, you know, Brock Bottom and Tori Nato, Lana Slide. I mean, they're just hilarious and the artwork is really, really, really good on them. Um, and it's, it's too bad that it doesn't get more love, um, cause it really should. It's, it's really a beautiful and fun game. And like I said, easy for kids to play, um, and everyone that I show this to just falls in love with it. It's it's quick. I think it takes, I mean, we played through a game, I want to say, with, we were four adults and we played through in about 45 minutes. So it's, it's a pretty quick game and it doesn't take up a lot of table space and it's very fast. It just, you know, just keep continuously going around the turn or the table playing your cards. And then, like I said, each turn you're going to flip one of these event cards. Now, some of them are pretty neat, like this one here. So this one is Perilous Places. All players lose victory points for their two pawns. And you would lose one for being in the forest, three for being in the prairie, and two for being in the, um, the brown area, which is the... Um, 
Valley, I believe. So, yeah, it really changes it up every turn. And then, and then, like I said, too, if you're playing with less players, if you're playing with, you know, four players or three players or two, you're going to flip one of these, and it's going to block you from being able to select that action. So if you were stuck in a mountain or in a um, hill region, sorry, that's what the brown is, mountain or hill, and then this card came up in the deck that is blocking you from playing it, well, you now can't deliver in that area. So you're going to have to use a witch to move you to a different area so that you can potentially deliver to collect victory points in that area. So yeah, it's a really streamlined, really simple game. And the set collecting in the end can really make a big difference. So here you have these little um, boards that just help you remind or help remind you of what they're worth. So every four, you know, one lightning bolt is three. Um, two lightning bolts, six, so on and so forth. So you can see that you can try and collect victory points that way. Now you also get victory points for any leftover resources in the end. So those sets of resources, if I have one of each color plus a wand, is also going to be worth four victory points. There's a few different ways that you can go about it. Now on the board as well, on the outside regions of the board, the towers do go up in victory points quite a bit and for that reason it makes sense because you're having to travel so much further to get to some of these regions but if you can come through here and get to these regions and hit like a nine a seven a nine a seven a ten a nine i mean you're so much more efficient it's going to take you more time to get there but then your cowardly actions aren't as bad because you're gaining so much more victory points but if you stay around some of these areas, you know, you're only collecting four victory points, one victory point, three. So you're needing to take those brave actions more so than if you were on the side of the board. So some people tend to stay around here and try and go for the brave actions. Um, otherwise, you can try and move out and get some of the other um, actions. And people tend not to go out there, so you do have more access to the clouds, some other things too. Um, yeah, I just honestly, like, I can't recommend this game enough. It's, it's so cute and so fun and it's, it doesn't feel very, um, take that. Even though you're missing out on your action, it's more funny in a way. I mean, I've never played with anybody who's ever gotten upset about losing their action. Um, it's always kind of a surprise and a little bit funny. So if you're looking for a lighter pick up and deliver good game for kids, this one is fantastic and huge props to um, Aaliyah who made this game, or I guess Ravensburger, um, who made this game and it's, um, yeah, it, it's great. And it used to be...